Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's program. Um, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, we are in the afternoon, and my name is Lois Black. I'm curator of special collections at the Lehigh University Libraries. Thank you for joining us from around the globe for the final Friends of the Libraries program of the year, a conversation with Dr. Lydia Pine, who will discuss postcards, places, and participation with Professor Scott Paul Gordon. I'd like to begin by thanking the Friends of the Lehigh Libraries for making today's program possible. I'd also like to thank my colleagues in Special Collections for proposing the exhibit, No Postage Necessary, Views of the Postcard World. The exhibit is on display in Linderman Library through the end of the month and is available online as well. I hope you'll follow the link in the chat after today's program to visit virtually. And mentioning the chat, the chat will be disabled, but you'll still have a chance to view messages if not to contribute um, yourself as audience members. Uh, you'll see a note um, coming up soon that indicates that you should use the Q&A function for any questions that um, may arise during the program. Uh, there are two additional Friends of the Libraries programs scheduled next spring as part of a year-long series on climate change. Please mark your calendars for David Casagrande, Director of Lehigh's Environmental Initiative, on Wednesday, February 15th in 2023. And also for Elizabeth Sawin, who is the founder and director of the Multi Solving Institute and an, ex and an expert on solutions that address climate change. That presentation will be on campus on Wednesday, April 26th of 2023. Today, I'd like to thank Lydia Pine and Scott Gordon for generously spending the next hour with us in this virtual Friends of the Lehigh Libraries program, Postcards, Places, and Participation. Postcards figured prominently in our programming this semester in Special Collections. In conjunction with our exhibit, Special Collections presented a seminar on postcards to our first year students, including their history, timelines, and transcriptions. Students had the opportunity to send their own postcard. And surprisingly to me, this was a first for many of them. So now we will hear from Lydia Pine, a writer and historian interested in the history of science and material culture. She has degrees in history and anthropology and a PhD in biology with a focus on the history and philosophy of science from Arizona State University. Her field and archival work has ranged from South Africa, Ethiopia, and Uzbekistan, as well as the American Southwest. Her research interests are diverse and include history of archaeology, anthropology, and paleoanthropology, history of science, literary nonfiction, history of ideas, and Pleistocene studies. Her writing has appeared in The Atlantic, Nautilus, Slate, History Today, Hyperallergic, and Time, as well as archaeology. In addition to her 2021 book, Postcards, The Rise and Fall of the World's First Social Network, her books include Endlings, Fables for the Anthropocene in 2022, Genuine Fakes, How Phony Things Teach Us About Real Stuff in 2019, and Seven Skeletons, The Evolution of the World's Most Famous Human Fossils in 2016. Mm. Dr. Pine is currently a visiting researcher at the Institute for Historical Studies at the University of Texas at Austin, where she is an avid rock climber and mountain biker. After receiving his PhD in English from Harvard, Scott Paul Gordon came to Lehigh University in 1995, where he is currently the Andrew W. Mellon Chair at Lehigh. He teaches courses at the undergraduate and graduate level in 18th century transatlantic literature. He has served as chair of the Department of English and as chair of the Department of History, and he has directed Lehigh's first year writing program and the Lehigh University Press. Gordon's edition of the vast correspondence of Mary Penry, who immigrated from Wales in 1744 and lived as a single sister in Moravian communities at Bethlehem and Lidditz, was published by Penn State University Press in 2018 as the Letters of Mary Penry, a single Moravian woman in early America. 
Her current research focuses on religion, social ambition, and patriotism in colonial and revolutionary Pennsylvania by exploring the lives of worldly Moravians. Professor Gordon collected the works of Moravian minister D. Cornelius Minor, who photographed many buildings, streets, and bridges in Nazareth and Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Minor printed many of his photographs as real photo postcards, each signed DCM during the golden age of real photo postcards, when both professional and amateur photographers printed images directly to postcard stock. Special Collections is grateful to Professor Gordon for loaning examples from his collection of postcards to the current exhibit. And I'm pleased to welcome Lydia and Scott to our Zoom session today. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and welcome, Lydia, to Lehigh, virtually at least. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I just want to say how much I really enjoyed your book. It's a superb book. Um, and I thought I might start by just asking you how you came to imagine writing this book, which is which does a lot of things. It, it, it gives the history of postcards, um, which I think anybody interested in postcards would be really interested in knowing from, you know, how they began and how they were printed and how they were circulated. Um, and then it has a lot of other histories as well, some which you might expect, histories of the Postal Service, but also histories of tourism and histories of propaganda. So it really covers a lot of ground. And then there's also personal history in it, in that you return often to this box of postcards that I yeah. think it was your great grandfather um, who preserved um, most mostly written around 1910 or so or received mm -hmm. around 1910. So I just I just wondered how you came to conceive of such a sort of uh, sort of a, a book that covers so many things. <laughs> so wide ranging. I like yeah. that. Thank you. Um, so to answer your question, I was I was thinking that I would go ahead and show a couple examples um, of some of the collections that that inspired me that got me excited about postcards here. And um, let me just quickly share my screen here. All right. And uh, what we have here is I wanted to highlight one of the postcards um, from this box that you mentioned um, that is actually an embroidered postcard. Um, and this was one of the most unusual examples of postcards that I ended up coming across in my, um, in my research for the book is it's an embroidered postcard from World War I. And uh, my great grandfather, uh, bought it when he was in France and it, it became part of this, this family collection. But I wanted to back up a minute before, before diving into that, that postcard box um, and to talk a little bit about sort of where the idea for the book came from. And um, in 2015, I was working on the research and writing of a different book called Bookshelf, which is a object and cultural history of bookshelves. And as part of that book, um, I spent some time at the New York Public Library looking at the institutional history of giant library shelves. And as when I was at the New York Public Library, I had the opportunity to come across this amazing archive of postcards at the library. And it absolutely blew my mind that it was just sort of floor to as tall as I am file cabinets full of postcards. And you can see here a couple examples and there's castles and castles that start with D and castles that start with R. And it completely blew my mind that there could be this many different kinds of postcards, that the medium could be so flexible and so vast and so big. And I started, I pulled out the drawers and I started looking through them and I could see messages that were from people that I had no idea who they were going to people that I had no idea who they were. And it was like watching this social network that was suspended. It was like you were intercepting text messages or something, but they were printed. And it really piqued my curiosity. Um, it, really, it really piqued my curiosity about what, what is going on with postcards and how do they act as this really kind of flexible, interesting media. And so here are another couple examples. I love the idea that, that here there were 
castles and cathedrals and you could have the same picture the same building that were that was that was revisited time after time and um it could be revisited in different kinds of printing technology and here it's in black and white and here it's in color and here it's sketched and here it's colorized and here this is a slightly different angle but there was something really sort of expected about the image that was going to be on the postcard and I found that really uh really intriguing so this is one of the boxes that uh that you mentioned here Scott that was a family collection and so around 2018 I decided that I really wanted to dive into the to a history of postcards and to look at them as material objects and to look at this as a as a question of a social and infrastructural network and I mentioned the idea to my parents um, when I was visiting that holiday season and my mom got so excited she's like oh wait we have all of these postcards all of these boxes of family postcards they're going to be really relevant for this project and I I kind of took them politely of uh, just okay thanks mom you know I really appreciate the help that's that's lovely and I started digging into them and it was amazing. It was like a microcosm of that New York Public Library archive just in like a series of four or five shoe boxes. And as I was looking through these postcards, I found things like that linen embroidered postcard. I found things that were real picture postcards. I found linen ridged ones. I found the most mundane text message like kind of messages that were being sent and exchanged. And it really helped me understand and to think about postcards being personal and postcards being tied to um, to specific places. And so one of the uh, one of the other postcards that I really liked, um, I should add once once word got out, my extended family was just like, yes, we have all of these saved things. And finally, I knew I was saving them for a purpose. Here you go. And now I joke that I've become like the keeper of postcards in shoe boxes. And I'm not 100% certain what to do with them now that the project is over. But but all that aside, um, this was the one on the right there is a postcard from Lascaux, France from 1990. Um, my grandparents had gone there um, as tourists to visit. And uh, my grandmother picked up the postcard, but she never sent it. But she sent it to me in it as a postcard. She never sent it as a postcard, but she sent it to me uh, when I started working on this project with this post-it note stuck on top of it that said, I ran into these, they might be of interest to you, love Gigi. And I love the, the parenthetical aside that goes onto this postcard with, we've been there. And it had this like moment of clarity for me about what postcards are doing in authenticating travel and experience there. And so this became one of the themes that I really wanted to, to pursue. Um, here are just some other examples to really highlight the breadth and the depth and the flexibility of the, of the media. And I think, yes. And so I did want to, I did want to sort of highlight one other um, exhibition that was really informative to me and my thinking about this and the topic. This is uh, the artist Zoe Leonard's You See I Am Here After All, which she put together in 2008. And this particular installation is from the Whitney Museum in 2018. And uh, the, the installation that she's put together is over 3,400 postcards from Niagara Falls. And there are postcards that she's collected and they're arranged here uh, by type. And so you can see that these are all of this particular, this particular shot. Um, and again, looking at this, it struck me that this is an amazing scale of mass production to be able to have this many postcards that are around 100 plus years later to even be demonstrated as something as this mass on this kind of mass scale, but then to see how different they are. That if the more the more you sort of drill down on each postcard, the more you can see these personal details. And so, for example, this one says, "Dear Stella, how would you like to see this? Um, send me a card, and I will do the same." And it's here from 1907, and it's just this almost banal message that's going back and forth. But but the message is, I found, I think, so much more encoded in. Um, 
in the material and the act of sending and the participation of sending that. Um, so yeah, so those are the, those I would say, let me go ahead and just stop sharing here. Uh, those, are, those are the examples of postcards that I found that really helped point me toward the themes that I wanted to explore in this book. Um, in the history of postcards, there are, oh, there are so many different histories, brilliant histories of postcards, of pick this particular artist or pick this particular genre, and you can find you can find a history of that. And what I wanted to do with this project was to find sort of big, big uniting things. Yeah. Um, I want to get back to that, um, the comment on that last card you showed, the send me a card, because I see that all the time. But but before I go there, I just wanted to ask you, so did that family shoebox, the stuff you found in it, did that end up sort of shaping what you ended up talking about in the book? Or did you use those um, just sort of when necessary to illustrate things you were already sort of planning to write about in this sort of, you know, very, like you said, wide ranging history of postcards and their uses. And I found that, so there are definitely a lot of examples that I use as illustrative examples yeah. in the text. Um, and that was, that was due to simply having access to the yeah. images um, yeah. not having to sort through permissions or copyright or yeah. or things like that, but these were family objects and so it was easy to reproduce them. Yeah. But I also felt that there were so many that were illustrative of these bigger trends and that being able to find them in this microcosm really helped illuminate yeah. how they could be present in other collections that, yeah. hey, if this particular thing from great grandpa Robert's shoebox is of interest I bet that if you went and looked in your family collection you would find something similar or I if you went and looked at this institutional collection in New York or online at Lehigh you would find these mm -hmm. these sorts of themes and you would find examples of that yeah one of the things that totally stunned me about the information you provide in the book is just the size of the phenomena itself I mean I think I think you say postcards were first introduced in 1869, maybe. The first day they went on sale in Germany, 45,000 sold in Berlin alone, and 3 million in Austria in three months. And then in one year, you mentioned, I think, 231 million in 1875. So people adopted this new um, <clears throat> way to communicate so rapidly. Yes, I, the the numbers were something that I found myself really going through and make, and checking with a lot of sources where I just thought I maybe this is a typo, maybe this is maybe this is not quite right. <clears throat> and it really impressed on me the scale of communication that not only are they not only are postcards being manufactured on this this mass scale, but they're being sent and they're being received, they're being bought that every sort of way to participate in this network of communication, people are doing it. Um, I think that historians have estimated that in the golden age of postcards, something like 200 billion postcards were manufactured and sent. And I just, I can't think of another artifact that humankind has made and exchanged. And that to me is, is a really powerful way of thinking about postcards. Right. I think you say at one point, it's the largest class of artifacts that people have ever exchanged. Yes. Which is amazing. Yes. That, you know, more than, more than projectile points or more than letters or more than any other kind of communication medium, this, this exists at a scale that is, that is almost beyond comprehension. Yeah. Um, and even, even I was surprised too, when you talk about real photo postcards, which are these postcards that people could have cameras and then print directly yeah. um, to, to paper that would produce the card and then they could send images of their homes or images of streets, uh, which a lot of people collect, as you know, yes. um, that the cameras were even very accessible in cost. I think the first, you mentioned one that maybe was in, in modern dollars would have cost something like 650 or $700, which I was thinking, well, that's not really accessible to everyone. And then I'm thinking we all have phones. I mean, everybody has phones, which cost that much. But then the next generation camera, like the next year or two, it was just a, a few dollars, I think. Not not our money. I forget what the 
the translation would be, but it was much cheaper. Right. That suddenly there's it's it's almost like this this shift in the kind of postcards that are possible to envision that yeah. it's not just Kurt type producing billions of postcards. Right. But here you you personally could take a picture and and put it on a postcard. Yeah. Um, and that that was really interesting to me to sort of think about the role of authentication and the role of sort of memory making and what what can the postcard do to document this time this place yeah. um and i would say the the sort of interesting way that that connects back to pictures at a mass scale were uh real photo postcards were often uh used as images for reprinting in newspapers and sort of the nascent days of photojournalism yeah. and so um certainly in things um around the turn of the 20th century real postcards could be something that were reproduced in newspapers. And so again, you sort of have that image coming back and, and circulating on a mass scale. Yeah, I think one of the interesting, I guess you'd call it themes that runs through the book is uh, on the one hand, you talk about these companies, I guess I didn't know how to pronounce it, Kurt Teich, is that how yeah. you, um, that produce postcards on mass scale that people are buying and sending. So in a way there, that company, I guess is, has a lot of influence on what images get sent, yeah. things like that. So, and then you also talk about postcards as propaganda, but then there's this capacity for any individual to take their own photos and put it on a card, which I think you talk about as a much more democratizing aspect of the whole phenomena. So you get both aspects, I think. I feel like it really speaks to the flexibility of a postcard. Mm -hmm. That when, I think it's very easy to think of a postcard as just the thing that says, greetings from and it it almost feels predictable and what I found were all of these other ways these other almost like social niches that <laughs> postcards could fill in communication and you're right things like the the real picture postcards and being able to take a picture and print it personally and have have it be almost a one-off yeah sort of created this really different kind of niche to put it back in this the circulating mass of postcards. I mean, I would guess the real photo postcards are the most collectible. I mean, it's, I know it's what I collect, but I would think they're the most collectible just because the images, like you say, it could just be one off. They, they can be unique. I suppose things like the very first postcard coming out of Germany, which you talk about in the, or th those obviously very clear. Sure, sure. But other than that, I would think real photos would be sort of the particularly desirable things just because they can be unique. It's interesting that the postcard collectors from what I've seen, and I should I should preface this by saying that I myself am not a collector other than the sort of five token shoe boxes that I, was I have ask you know, that somewhere in my you, office here. I was gonna ask whether you yourself are a collector of any <laughs> sort of postcards, but no, no, I like to think of myself as a postcard enthusiast mm -hmm. and and sort of um a family collector of postcards. Um I think that what is particularly interesting and sort of what makes something collectible and what makes it special or what gives it value is sort of its intersection of time and place and what the collector wants out of it. And so um, certainly the sort of firsts or the, the this is the first postcard or this is this postcard at this particular moment is going to be unique. But there are also postcards that are valuable and interesting because somebody famous sent them. Mm -hmm. Or there are particularly, you know, oh, this is really interesting because it's a misprint. And so there are really interesting overlaps between sort of what makes any kind of print collectible, what makes any kind of art collectible. But since postcards are fundamentally the social phenomenon, somebody who's interested in... Uh, windmills of the Southwest yeah. are going to are going to value real picture postcards with that particular right. motif in a way that that somebody else might not. Right. When you showed that picture, um, I guess it was from one of the one of the drawers from the yeah. New York Public Library, and they were organized by castles. Yes. It made me anxious because oh, when, no. I go to postcard show, when I go to postcard shows to collect things because I collect places like Bethlehem. Yeah. I need them to be organized by place, you know? So, and, and a lot of dealers organize things by topic like castles. 
yeah. or railroads or hospitals. And so I go in and I see those and I know I can't look through them because I don't have the time to look through all the hospitals on the object. But there could be a Bethlehem hospital in there. Yeah. So when I saw the castles, I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, no. why didn't they organize those by place? I would be, I would like that much better. But obviously every collector is going to organize it as he or she, based on what he or she is interested in or imagines other people will look for one day. I'm so excited actually that, well, I'm not excited that that caused you anxiety. That's horrible. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry to that the collector in you was, was having their blood pressure raised here. Yeah. But um, I will say that parts of the New York Public Library collection, that specific collection are organized by geography. Yeah. And um, a specific example of looking at that geography helped me find another theme to explore later on in the book, which is how postcards are tied to specific times and places and countries. And how do we think about postcards from countries that no longer exist? Yeah. And so for example, uh, the New York Public Library, you can go and pull out the drawer that says Czechoslovakia. And there you're sort of looking at this historical moment. And one of the things that I felt was really powerful about postcards is that it had this capacity to tap into past geography and to really be an artifact of time and place. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that was a very interesting chapter about postcards from places that no longer exist. That was, yeah, that was really excellent. Um, you, you call you call postcards in the book sort of the, um, like the, I, th I think you call it the first global social network. Um, so I was interested in that, uh, partly because, you know, letter writing was around for a, a long time, um, maybe not as accessible to everyone as postcards became. So I'm wondering, um, is it the vastness that, that, that the vastness of the communication that sort of suddenly happens that, that led you to sort of that, that description? It's one of those descriptions that I kind of went back and forth with, where I kind of, you know, I thought, okay, <clears throat> pardon me. I can find, well, you know, here's this example and here's here's some really other older stuff or, yeah. you know, would this be another way to describe it? And one of the things that I felt like really helped substantiate the idea of postcards being this social network that um, letter writing didn't have was the format of how the material format of the postcard that it has a blank space that sort of expects the, the sender and the respondent to participate yeah. together. The same way a text message might be expected yeah. to be read or a tweet would be expected to be read. Yeah. Um, I think that certainly letter writing and correspondence and things like that, of course, like those are creating global networks of knowledge and exchange and things like that. But I think the idea that there's that people are just communicating with each other and building connections between places, I felt like, <clears throat> pardon me, really, really was underscored by that, mm -hmm. that expected participation of the media. Yeah. The other thing that was really interesting to me um, about the postcards were all of the, all of the treaties and laws in Europe that were developed in the mid 19th century to <clears throat> basically hash out who was going to pay the postage. That yeah. letter writing had a really long tradition of mm -hmm. how letters are going to be delivered, who pays for what and how that's how that's finessed out. Yeah. But postcards kind of, it was like, well, how do you, how do we stamp this? How do we postage this? Yeah. And so the the idea that there was sort of the infrastructure, the governmental infrastructure necessary to to figure that out, I felt like really, really underscored that this is a different kind of network. Yeah, yeah, it was, it's amazing that they agreed on the size, that every, every, almost everyone would have a, a universal size for the object. Yeah, yeah, which is completely different than what you see, right, in historical yeah. correspondence. I wonder, I mean, I, I didn't think about this till just hearing you talk, but I was, and, and um, anyway, did you encounter any postcards where people were, reluctant about were, were 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 anxious or reluctant to write things because of the publicness of the side of you know letters could be sealed even though in the 18th century certainly a lot of people thought their letters might be opened and they were cautious and used bearers rather than public postal systems because you could trust the bearer of someone you knew rather right. than a public system but in the postcard it's all right there whatever you write it you know it really it really is like you're just posting this right it's yeah. just this message that's here 
Um, and so certainly, yes, there's a very sort of, I think, performative aspect. There's an, there's an understanding that it's not really private. And so one of the, some of the early legislation in Europe, uh, for example, was around what, what was appropriate to put on a postcard, that you couldn't have things that were profane and you couldn't oh. have things that were offensive in sort of the early decades of postcards yeah. as people are sorting this out. But there's also sort of, as you say, an expectation that it's, that any message is going to be coded in meaning um, if if it's sensitive or if it's, or if it's, yeah, you know, there's a concern about it being read, but it really is sort of a public, a public facing message, a public sort of participation in it in a way that letter writing, I think is, is not. Yeah, because of the expectation of privacy, maybe. Right, right. Yeah. I thought what you mentioned a few minutes ago about how postcards require participation and you have an interesting section in the book about sort of the importance of the blank yes. there is really interesting. Um, and I, I wondered about, well, the thing you mentioned, the thing that you showed in that earlier card about send me a card. I mean, yes. it seems like from, from all the postcards I've seen and collected that comes up a lot. Like here's your postal, make sure you send one in return. It seems like they also impose quite a sense of obligation. They almost like are demanding um, something in reply. And it seems like they were collecting early on. Mm -hmm. Like people, you know, are collect. You, I mean, you talk about this a, a bit as well uh, when people would buy sets early on, but right. it seems like people just wanted to get these postals and collect the postals and. No, I, I was going to ask you actually a, a similar question in your experience of collecting of just Hey, I got your note. Send me a note. I, you know, it's almost like you got my text message, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's right. it's a lot of them don't even a lot of them don't even have a note. It's like here's your postal. Send one back. Yep. You know, here's your picture. I went here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went here, um, and, and you know, I want I want something back from you, as if they're gathering these collections so early on, or maybe there they are just some really cool albums that are that are created early around the sort of late 19th, early 20th century for people to collect mm -hmm. uh, their postcards that come in their correspondence. And um, there are certainly examples of personal collections that are being curated like that. Uh -huh. Like, oh, here's all of, all of the postcards from Uncle Bill that, mm -hmm. you know, are in my collection now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, and then there are the collections that you that you mentioned that are sold as sets. So, for example, uh, women's suffrage movement, early twentieth century. Uh, there were lots of examples of real picture postcards that were sold as sets that people could buy to participate in the suffrage movement, even if you couldn't maybe go to a rally or a parade or something. That this was another way of participating in it, and the set was could be something that you could either send out in mass or it could be something that you that you collected and held again because they're they're filling both the communication niche but also filling that sort of photograph niche of how mm -hmm. we might you know take a selfie today or something like that and yeah. so i think that the the sets and the collections are doing this really interesting sort of social work there mm -hmm. yeah one of the um I guess technologies you'd say that you talk about in the book that had to be sort of on the ground working before before um, postcards could really take off is is just mail delivery. And I remember in the book you talk a lot about the 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 emergence of uh, of rural mail delivery, which wasn't, I guess, urban mail delivery happened much more yeah. ha happened earlier, and rural mail delivery gra only gradually. Um, but I know from a lot of the postcards uh, that I collect too that like. The, the the delivery is very quick you know yeah. they would they would they would send something early in the morning saying i'm coming tomorrow night and they would have full confidence that the person is going to get it much better than our i mean we think things <laughs> improve but much better than our mail service certainly in the last few years yes um and so there's the i think that your point about the the postcard depends on this reliable mail service yeah. and that becomes this really interesting layer of infrastructure that's necessary for the social network, the postal, like the postcard social network to, to function. Yeah. But um, I think that what is so interesting, so 
this is a bit of an aside. Um, as part of this, I, for years, sent postcards weekly to my Gen Z nieces and nephews, just as sort of like a social experiment. Like Lois mentioned at the beginning of the, the discussion here, um, I was really curious, like, do my Gen Z nieces know what a postcard is? And I thought that this would be a fun way to introduce them to, to postcards. And um, at one point, I finally timed it, the postcard going from Austin to Phoenix and and looking at the rates of like sending and delivering for mm -hmm. postcards a hundred years earlier, it was faster. Mm -hmm. uh, the mail was faster a hundred years mm -hmm. earlier, which I thought was yeah. interesting and maybe maybe a bit depressing, as you say yeah. about about mail today. But it was, I thought, an interesting demonstration about the expectations of what. The postal infrastructure needed to have in order to facilitate the the postcards. Yeah, you um, you me you mentioned earlier, I think uh, Twitter mm. and uh, text messages, and I think in the book a few times you mentioned Instagram because mm -hmm. it's sort of a, a a blend of images with text, sort of like postcards. Um, and I was wondering whether you, I mean, is um. Do you think that postcard sellings were the original postcard senders were as sort of narcissistic as we are today? I mean, <laughs> I guess there are selfies in real photo postcards. Yeah. There's a lot of postcards of people. I think they're the least collectible ones, actually, because they're not usually place based and you don't know who the people are. So you see stacks of them everywhere and no one buys them. Or um, So there were selfies of people. But to me, at least those real photo postcards are very place based, like they're not focused on the person they're focused on. I'm just wondering, I, you have much more wide experience than I do. I mean, I, do you in, Instagram seems very, you know, it's it's about the selfie. So I joke, I think I joked to my editor at some point during this project, and I said, show me an Instagram post and I can show you the postcard. Uh huh. I can show, I can find a postcard that's going to fill yeah. that same niche. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's food yeah. or yeah. vacation or some horrific racist trope. I can find yeah. a postcard that is going to fill that same, that same niche. And so I think that there, there's, um, there's a notion that some things just sort of perform well socially. And so Twitter, Instagram, whatever are going to tap into that sort of performativity of a message being sent and received. Um, your question about sort of specific though, um, I think that Instagram is an easy parallel to postcards because it's so pictorial and so, so image-based, but I find myself more drawn, I think, to parallels with Twitter mm -hmm. with the uh, character limit mm -hmm. where a message was was conscribed by what could fit in the space. Mm -hmm. And to me, that felt like a more interesting parallel because the sender and the recipient had these constraints. Yeah. Um, um, let me ask you a slightly different question that I, I'm interested to, to sort of know about is the, I think there were some in the family collection that were like this, but postcards, that really made a lot about the sort of physical object because you really are able to deliver, like you say, you know, physical object into someone else's hands very quickly. In, in the in the uh, Lois mentioned that I wrote this book, or just I didn't write mm -hmm. the book, but I, I published the letters of this uh, 18th century woman, and she will often cry on a letter, and she'll point to it and she'll say, you know, look, you can see I cried. I you know there are 18 tears on this letter. You can see yeah. them right here. And it's just as you get that sense of that physical object moving from someone's hand to another hand. Um, and and I, I would think postcards would function very much the same way because you really, you weren't just putting words to, you weren't just delivering words like you would in a text or something, right. but an object you could really be sure was going to get in someone else's hands. Yeah, the I interviewed... Uh, a Russian historian, Alison uh, Raleigh, who has done some amazing work with uh, postcards of the Russian Revolution and Soviet propaganda postcards, some really interesting stuff. And she pointed to some examples that she had come across in her research where um, there were examples of prisoners who would talk about tracing oh. 
the words over the postcard that had been sent that they had received. And so it, I think, is exactly tapping into this, this almost sort of pathos that you're talking about where the material is more of a connection than just the, the message. Yeah. The material is almost more than the message, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Were there um, were there topics that that you wanted to write about that that didn't make it into the book? I mean, I'm sure there were. Um, I mean, again, it covers so many things from propaganda to geography to um, you know the nuts and bolts of the postal of the po postal industry, how you produce postcards, tourism. It covers a lot of ground, but there must have been some other grounds that. <laughs> <laughs> that, you, that you wanted to cover or wish you could cover or imagine volume two that would cover. Oh yeah, I like that. You said the project was over, but our project's ever really ever over. over. No, that's that's true. <laughs> that is that is very true. Um, one of the things that became a really interesting, interesting sticking point um, in going through this is what when you say postcard, what is it exactly that you mean? Yeah. And I'm sure that you've come across this at fairs and mm -hmm. collect collectors and the the difference between the postcard and the trading card and the printing card and the 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 sort of all of the different kinds of print media and i think that if i were to expand the project out i would look for other ways to think about print being a social phenomenon that that was one of the themes that really felt like it resonated with me that that this is an interesting way to look at connection. And I think that I would look at other kinds of cheap disposable print ephemera that were happening in conjunction with postcards, like like the uh, the vintage like uh, print cards or trading cards or things like that. Mm -hmm. that i I felt like was filling an adjacent niche, but not exactly a, a similar niche. That people exchanged as, that were also yeah. things that people exchanged, but maybe didn't write notes on or something. Exactly. There wasn't, it didn't necessarily need a stamp and someone to yeah. take it from one place to another. Um, and that yeah. really kind of piqued my curiosity. Yeah. Although like, like we sort of talked about before, it often seems like people are, you know, sending the postcards for the Im just to exchange the images rather than really to communicate anything meaningful or even you know even minor right. in the note itself i mean some of them just say here's your postal send me one back so yep. that is almost like trading cards yeah yeah and so i i would be really curious to sort of see what other kind of print are functioning that kind in that kind of social niche mm -hmm. um at the same at the same point I actually had a quick question for you. Something that you had said really kind of piqued my curiosity um, when you were talking about um, real picture postcards and how um, the really collectible ones are seem to be really tied to place over people. And yeah. I was curious if you could tell me a little bit more about sort of how you how you've seen that phenomenon play out? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure that that's true. That's my impression <laughs> as a collector. I, 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 I suspect there are other collectors in the among the participants, and I'd sure. be to know what they think um, too. I mean, I, I it does it has struck me a, a, over the years that you know what a what a family would collect is utterly different than what a yeah. collector would collect because the family is collecting images of the family, but those really only matter to the family. And then they might also have images of places, but then when that photo album say passes out of the family, suddenly it's the exact reverse. It's the images of the places that someone else might be interested in and the images yeah. of the people, probably no one. I mean, again, I'm just wondering about all this. The images of the people probably are less interesting to others. So my sense is that most postcard collectors um, today, whether it's real photo postcards or printed cards or whatever, mm -hmm. Um, are either interested in, as you said before, topics, um, mm -hmm. you know, castles or hospitals or whatever, <laughs> railroads, or are interested in particular makers. Yeah. Or are interested in particular places. Like you say a lot, you know, I think you mentioned when you mentioned the, um, is it the New York Public Library that has the the great postcard collection that you, that you showed? So the there's that, uh, there's also uh, Newberry. 
Oh, has you okay. the Kurt Tyke yeah. uh, collection. You mentioned well. a number of people go in yeah. there. They immediately go to their hometown and see what yeah. the library. Oh, the new yes, the New York yeah. Public Library, where it's like, yeah. no, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna yeah. go look for so where I'm from. It seems to me mostly people collect either topics or places. Yeah. And and then the the selfie kind of thing, the images from the family that they took to send yeah. the image around. Those those sort of get less, become less important. Yeah. To other collectors, though they're yeah. the most important things to the family, probably. Sure. No, that, that's interesting. Thank you. you I, one, one of my favorite words in the book, I, if, I think I copied it down correctly, was postal carditis. That, <laughs> um, and, and I think that was used really early on, the sense that people, maybe it was people who were less enthusiastic about the postcard craze were sort of mocking the craze itself. But um, Yes, it's not a word that I can take credit for and right, not a right. word that I think right. I want to take credit right. for. Right. But yes, no, there was there were some really funny sort of turn of the 20th century snobbery almost yeah. about postcards that yeah. this is, you know, how how lazy are you? You can't even pick yeah. up a pen and a letter and yeah. write a letter and, right. and put, find an envelope and send it the way proper correspondence should be right and I felt like it almost was tapping into that democratization of correspondence yeah. where yeah. suddenly it's it's okay to just say hey here's your picture send me one back yeah and that that wouldn't be the same way that you would see letter correspondence happen before and so your your postcarditis um was a was a phrase that was used in a couple of uh sort of snippy uh yeah. op-eds from the turn of the 20th century the almost the way any new technology gets gets ridiculed by you know by by some group yep it's just oh come on can't you can't you just do it the way we've been doing correspondence yeah. here for centuries yeah um so to get back to the point lois maybe started us off with and you mentioned in the book a number of times um I mean, I guess I, I know the answer, but you don't think postcards are dead today. The, the, the technology is still used, but used uh, less frequently, or how would you describe the state of postcards today? It's funny. I think that as soon as I told anybody, oh, I'm working on a book about postcards, yeah. that's the first question yeah. I think that most people yeah. would ask is, oh, aren't they, do people even send postcards anymore? Aren't they yeah. extinct? And um, the answer is no which is really kind of exciting. Yeah. Um, but I think that the social niche, the correspondence niche that they're filling has shifted. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a couple of really fun examples that I would want to highlight about sort of where I find postcard, where I found postcards that are sort of alive and vibrant in the 21st yeah. century. Uh, one is a group called Post Crossings where people basically, it's like a postcard club and uh -huh. you can, send postcards you can send and receive postcards like if you want to participate yeah. in this and that's yeah. yeah this is for postcard enthusiasts yeah um another one would be postcards from Timbuktu all oh, right which was really interesting you can send you can go online and order a postcard and it will be sent from Timbuktu I sent my editor a postcard from Timbuktu and she thought that that was really quite unexpected <clears throat> which is really, which was really kind of fun. Um, and then there are, I would say, sort of the political motivated and activism postcards that have really made a resurgence in the US, particularly in the 2016 and 2020 elections, where they were postcards that were to get out the vote. And they really were sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, being sent to motivate people to participate in, in voting. Um, yeah. And then I would say that that there really are people that are just sort of embracing it as I'm going to do slow communication. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't want to send a text message. I want to go through the effort and for you to know that I went through the effort of finding a postcard and a stamp and a post box. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, what is interesting to me there is it feels like it's almost become a different it almost feels like it's a different niche of material at that point where a hundred years ago, it's treated as a disposable medium. Mm -hmm. But here it's like, oh, you took the effort and you found a stamp and you wrote a message and mm -hmm. wow, this really, this means something. 
Yeah. And so it's interesting, I think, to see that kind of social resonance shift. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, when so many are being sent, you know, for that quote, that number again, 45,000 yeah. in, in the first day, it's it's so or it must have felt ordinary at a certain yeah. point. And like you're pointing out now, it's just not ordinary anymore. It's an unusual thing that people have yeah. to time to do and have done mind. You have to go find a stamp and yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, I, I feel like most of the postcards, I feel like that dem democratizing thing that you mentioned, that's yeah. what sort of dropped. I mean, mostly I get postcards from businesses, you know, we sold a house down the street, we just <laughs> sell yours. Um, or, or like, or during political campaigns, yep. or to announce a talk or something, yep. you know, it's not everyday people producing and sending cards anymore. It seems different, yeah, different groups are using them still, but, but it's not yeah. that widespread phenomenon. And I would say that, <clears throat> pardon me, I would say that all of those, those instances that you point to, the, we sold a house down the street, yeah. or, hey, we're having a, we're having a sale. Yeah. These are all these are all postcards that would be sent turn of the you know end of the 19th turn of the 20th century yeah, as, as well. well. Yeah. yeah. There's an interesting question in the chat. I, I don't know when we want to turn to that and I honestly I forget whether Lois you or I were, <laughs> were going to manage the chat. But there's an interesting question about hmm. whether um you looked at all about the looked at all at um the old penny postcards which were blank which didn't have an image at all as i understand uh, but was a quick easy cheap way of communicating in the 50s and 60s i'm so excited that somebody brought those up because i think it speaks to we have this like image in our head of this is a postcard it has the picture mm -hmm. and then it has the the space on the back and i would i would add that the very first postcards did not have images and so the the penny postcards are sort of almost this, yeah, it sort of feels like it's almost revisiting this like sans image kind of kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> I did have a couple examples in the book um, from what were they? They were, <clears throat> pardon me, they were postcards that Stanford University used from 1900 to 1910 for scheduling faculty meetings and they had little like blanks that you that the that the department chair's secretary would fill in and then send to the people in the department to remind them about a faculty meeting mm -hmm. and so that that did not have an image a cheerful image to remind you about your faculty meeting it just sort of had the yeah. the fill in the blank again for that i wonder what a cheerful image to remind someone of a faculty meeting would be <laughs> I, w I really wanted to have this example, but it's just, it's blank on the, on the front. It just says, you know, address goes here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've seen postcards like that too, that, that are. It's almost like, like an in invitation or something. Yeah. Within yeah. a business uses them to, to send around intra business to, yeah. To communicate information or yeah. invite people to things. Yeah. I never really thought of those as postcards, but I guess those are. Those are it just tells it's, you how, how it's much stamped the, as a postcard. Right. And so I again it comes back to this really interesting question of what yeah. what is a postcard? Yeah. And how much we think the image is crucial yes. to a postcard, but but really yeah. wasn't really no, that was such a that was a really great question. I'm so excited to, yeah. to have somebody bring that up. Um great. Well, speaking of questions, it looks like a number have come in. So I, we can uh, switch to um some of the, the other questions at this point. And um, we have one actually for both of our panelists. Uh, the requester says um, he has a feeling that there are more collectors than actual postcard senders and receivers today. <laughs> what would happen to the postcard culture in 10 to 20 years? Even though there are visuals, are they sharing the same fate as print culture? Is there any hope that postcards will come back? Scott, as a collector, do you want to answer I mean, I'll that just first? Say, I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think what what if, if one goes to postcard shows, so I assume a lot of postcard, you know, those are all postcard collectors, and thousands of people are at a given mm -hmm. show. The one in there's one in York, Pennsylvania, um, just a few weeks ago. It's in November every year. It's the largest postcard show in the country, um, and it's huge. Um, but I would, I think, the collectors all think that 
that postcard collecting is dying too, that most of the sellers are older and um, every year there's sort of fewer of them. There's very few young um, sellers. I, I guess there's still probably a lot of collectors who, you know, who aren't selling, but, but the sense is that even postcard collecting um, is getting to be a smaller and smaller group. Um, yeah, that I, <clears throat> I ended up interviewing uh, for the book. I interviewed several um, postcard collectors in the UK in what ended up being the sort of early days of the pandemic. And uh, <clears throat> the collectors were all quite, it was quite, they were quite sad and felt that this was the, the being a postcard collector was kind of on its way out the yeah. way being the way sending postcards was. Yeah. Um, and so I, the, the point that I, the sort of the, the bit of hope that I would throw back out there though, is that postcards are flexible and this is an incredibly flexible, adaptable medium. And I think that, that maybe how it's going to be in 10 or 15 years is different than how it is now or how it was 50 years ago, mm -hmm. but it's hard for me to believe that it would be completely extinct. Mm -hmm. One of the, yes, one of the challenges um, with postcards, um, I, I found myself traveling over the recent Thanksgiving holiday, and one of the challenges with buying postcards, because again, I'm, I'm very old school, but it has always, with the exception of the penny postcards, been a challenge to find stamps or find correct postage. And I, I wonder how great an impact that might have had upon postcards being sent. Uh, is there a correlation between those that are preserved blank and those that actually did reach their intended recipient? Hmm. Yeah, I, not, I'll just say. A, a, yeah, please go ahead. Two, two seconds. Yeah. Among collectors, I think they're sort of divided between people who really want the, the postcard that was never sent has no stamp, has no stamp, no nothing, no message. And those who are happy with, or even prefer postcards that have, that have gone through the mail delivery service. Yeah, the question and Scott's, um, Scott's really great answer here really brought to mind this moment I had when I was <clears throat> writing the book. Um, I, I was really interested in the Kurt type postcards. And so I bought one off eBay and it came in this like, beautiful little sleeve and it was pristine and you know for <clears throat> eight decades nobody had written on it or anything and I had bought it because I wanted to send it to my niece I thought it would be funny to send something this old to her and I just I I I had it on my desk and I couldn't make myself write on it I just thought what kind of historian am I to take this artifact and and desecrate it and put it actually like put it in the mail and then I thought you know there this is a mass media if it's not this postcard it'll be somewhere and so I I, I sent it but yes that there really is this sort of split I think between between send or not send yeah I mean one of the great things about ones that are sent is you know the date and yes. if you collect a particular let's say photographer as I do, yeah. uh, you can sort of see when rough, you, you wouldn't know exactly because someone can buy it 80 years later and send it, but you know <laughs> roughly when they were circulating, you know, you have real photo postcards of a particular image say yeah. in Bethlehem that then showed up as printed cards. So you can see when the real photo is circulating if, if you have ones that had, had circulated and then you can see when the printed card circulated if they're not, if they've never been sent, that information just isn't present on the card. Yeah. Well, we, we have a question from, from an attendee who has divulged his age. He tells us he's in his mid-70s, and he asks whether you've spent any time speaking to folks that actually lived in an era that used postcards for all of these reasons. Um, have you gotten their insight as as to why they might have sent postcards? So I had the opportunity to, as I mentioned, to speak with postcard collectors um, and to, to include several interviews with them um, about sort of their lived experience with postcards. 
um, and then also sort of how they got interested in collecting them. Um, but in terms of sort of the communication of what, what, how are people, how do people use this kind of media? It's been really interesting to find them almost incidentally. For example, in looking at oh, research papers or correspondence from people, you find a postcard sort of just stuck in there. Um, I interviewed a historian um, and uh, literary critic who studies Edith Wharton, and she talked about finding postcards that Wharton, that Wharton had received, just finding them in her books, sort of being used as bookmarks. And examples like that, I feel like, were really interesting because they sort of speak to the everyday use and the utility of oh it's I'm just going to slide it into this book and use it as a use it as a bookmark, um, but certainly um, examples of of hey I'm going to I'm going to use this for actual correspondence I think the the famous example I included was uh, writer Jack Kerouac sending a postcard to his editor threatening to withdraw on the road unless he hears back immediately. So apparently that was, he preferred to send that via postcard, which I did not know until I did this project. That was a very bold postcard. I love that part of the book. What a thing. I to, did not, I did just, not just think that I have like the, yeah. the, the guts to do that, but yeah. wow. Yeah. And in a postcard, not even in a sealed letter. No, it's public. It's just, hey, take it or leave it, you know? <laughs> Right. Well, we have another question that um, might tie postcards more directly to today's social media. And mm. the, the question that's come in is what about memes as imagery comparable to the postcard? Uh, the, the question uh, thinking about the banality factor. Oh, that's really interesting. I think the closest parallel that I could find would be tropes and sort of thinking about um, here, I'm thinking particularly of suffragette and anti-suffragette propaganda um, at the turn of the 20th century. And you would see certain tropes start to emerge, particularly with anti-suffragette uh, pop postcards and propaganda with that of here, these horrible things are going to happen if women get to vote. And you would see variations on that theme played out in a plethora of different postcards. And so I think that it might be filling a similar cultural niche, maybe to, to what we would think about as a meme today. But I think that it would be more sort of variations on a theme, more like a, more like a trope, maybe. There were, there were, um, they were humorous postcards from the very start, I guess. And yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I I know this sort of this one, I guess you call it a genre of cards, like exaggeration cards where they'll show a farm wagon going by with one, you know, like a giant tomato on it or something or one huge cucumber. Um, and those are very early. So I guess, I guess the, the like a meme, sort yeah. of thing, I guess this, the humor part was present yeah. like, close to the start. Yeah, no, absolutely. So the, the question I think we've been discussing this evening, uh, the general question, why were postcards saved? <laughs> why does anybody save anything? I, no, okay, like that that's the flip answer. But I think the, the real answer is, I mean, as Scott was pointing out, family family things are saved because they're important to families, family images, family postcards. Um, I like to joke that um, our family is a pack rat family. And so of course that we have five shoe boxes full of postcards. Um, but institutionally, um, I would say that sort of like, okay, a couple of decades removed from the heyday of the golden age of postcards, certainly institutional collections are being created to, to sort of be able to create a record of particular genres of postcards or postcard technologies. So for example, the Newberry um, has an amazing collection of postcards where if you come across a Kurt type postcard, you can type in the manufacturer number that's on the serial number that's on the postcard and it'll tell you what date the postcard was manufactured. And so I think that in that sense, saving postcards today helps sort of with 
with that kind of seriation and that kind of being able to put it in its cultural place, postcards in their cultural places. Great. So another question is um, one that I've uh, given some thought to because I, I won't um, identify myself as a as a collector, but I, I look at postcards of glaciers specifically uh, from let's say the, the Rocky Mountains with, with some interest thinking about how the glaciers have receded over time and how these postcards might have documented um, climate change, for yeah. example. So the question that just came in is uh, similar in nature uh, what role can old postcards play in reconstructing historical sites or old buildings that have gone away? And um, well, there's a follow up question, but why don't we think about um, how they might help in historic preservation? Oh, that's such a good question. That's such an interesting, that's such an interesting point. Um, and I will say that there are several historians, colleagues of mine, that I have seen them use postcards as that kind of temporal marker, whether it's um, glaciers. Uh, there's a, a colleague of mine who's studying glaciers in Norway and has been using postcards as sort of a way to, to mark that. Um, or tourism in Norway and using glacial postcards as a way to, to talk about climate change. Um, and certainly the postcard can serve as a historical artifact itself, but then also as, as, the, <clears throat> as the question asker was pointing out, it can sort of serve as this temporal marker, like, hey, in 1907, this is what the building looked like and, and how, do we, how do we sort of negotiate that? And they certainly can become primary texts in that sense of sort of being able to mark a particular time in a particular place. And I think that that's part of Postcard's really interesting cachet. I, I was curious, like sort of what your sense of that was, especially with your collections of sort of old, of old historic cities and places. Yeah, I, I do think that um, postcards are often the only record or yeah. it, because those real photo postcards are so spectacularly clear yeah. Uh, images. They're often the best images of um, streetscapes or particular buildings that don't survive anymore. Yeah. I did just want to add into the into the record since since this is yeah. being recorded and will be replayed that uh, my friend Nancy Rutman posted um, a response to the question about why people saved postcards. It's such a good answer. She says um, postcards were saved because people, typically women, competed with each other for how many they could amass. It became a status <laughs> symbol. People would have postcard showers in honor of somebody's birthday and having a bulging photo album or bulging album full of postcards was sort of the equivalent to having a lot of friends on Facebook. So that's an interesting. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Thank you yeah. so much for for bringing that up. I love that. And I'm just I'm picturing some of the collector albums, the historic collector albums that I saw. And I'm just imagining them, this sort of bungeing, like yeah. This, this yeah. just filling. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Lois, there's a question here that really is sort of directed at you. I'm interested in knowing the answer too. Um, it, it says, why is the Lehigh exhibit of postcards that's up right now called No Postage Necessary? Was there a time when postcards were free to send or is that a title uh, that comments on the fact that they, they weren't necessarily mailed? And the question asker is also wondering whether the students you've, you've met with over the course of the semester and that one five by 10 you did have become co converts to post to post have become postcard senders. I think the postcard. I'll answer the the first to the actually last question first, which I, I think it's part of what Lehigh refers to as experiential learning. So the students had that experience of filling out a postcard, sending an address, and um, preparing it to mail it to family and friends. And um, while we did provide postage in this case and mail the postcards for them, it was a new medium for them. Yeah. So I, I think it was as much about having that experience, thinking about days gone by. Uh, their uh, students in general were too young to have that sense of nostalgia because our, our first year students tend to be, uh, are they about 18 years old, I think. So the first experience they had with this 
type of medium to send. It didn't, as they say, no batteries required. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the exhibit, um, we thought that it was, I mean, quite honestly, a, a catchy title, that there are a number of postcards that are sent through the mail. You're referring to those who are, those that come advertising real estate, those uh, that require a response to a general survey. They'll often say no postage necessary just to try and solicit that response to actually get a return. Um, I mean, that's true typically of solicitations um, since I, I might mention uh, this week was Giving Tuesday. We might see postcards in the mail that are re requesting a response that might be requesting support for a, a different purpose. So um, we struggled with the title because of course um, they most postcards that we find in tourist shops or curio shops might um, require a stamp. Um, I said that was one one thing that I noticed um, while traveling last week that um, many of the postcard shops did have postage paid postcards. It was figured into the cost of the actual postcard itself. Oh, that's interesting. So. So I see there are a, a number of other questions. There's one, I don't, I don't know what yes. this refers to, um, Lydia, but you, you probably do. Um, uh, somebody asked, does your book touch upon QSL cards? I feel like I should know what a QSL card is, but I'm not immediately, I should have Googled it while I was listening to your answer to the last question. I I think the the blank look on my face is probably the best answer. No, um, I'm not sure I'm familiar with that, but I would be willing to bet that it's that adjacent ephemera that I would love to explore mm -hmm. in a second volume. Mm -hmm. um, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another one of the... Um, questions is is there a I think the answer is no unfortunately but is there a is there a database that or databases that catalog postcards yes there is okay. there is actually um and I'm so excited to be able to to talk about them because they are absolutely brilliant so um they come usually through institutional um postcard collections like we were mentioning earlier I would point anybody toward the Newberry Library. It has an amazing online archive and collection. Uh, the Library of Congress has an amazing online archive and collection. Um, it also has several, uh, it has a giant database of um, polychrome uh, postcards that are absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. And if people are interested in looking at sort of images from around the world, approximately 1905 to 1910, I would definitely recommend checking out the Library of Congress. And actually Wikimedia Commons has an amazing database of postcards um, that if you sort of are interested in diving into the rabbit holes of Wikimedia Commons, um, they have an amassed and a truly astonishing database of postcards. Apparently, QSL cards are cards that ham radio operators use to communicate with one another. Oh, see, I'm I'm just writing this down right now for the second book that would be this this adjacent. So, thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. And now I now speaking of Wikipedia rabbit holes, I am excited yeah. to go down that one. Yeah, just the the size of the things as we talked about earlier. I forget how many postcards uh, the the uh, Kurt Teif produced but it was an enormous different cards it was enormous it's number. enormous yeah do they feel like they have catalog do they know every card they produced and is there a record of like is that a, is that a complete inventory or is it sort of the best they can do reconstructing it because i think that's one of the things about yeah. databases and and collecting anything is you don't know where the boundaries are because no yeah. one was you know putting them in library catalogs or right you know, Library of Congress registering books. There's no yeah. boundaries to to knowing what's actually out there. I think that I think that anybody would be really hesitant to say yes. This is everything of everything. 
um, in its collection, but the Newbery is incredibly complete mm -hmm. in what it has. And part of that comes from the fact that the collection was was sort of given to them from the, uh, yeah, yeah, from, the business. from the industry itself. Yeah. And so they really do have an amazing sense of records of how postcards were created, the postcards that were there and the process that put them out into the world. And so yeah. I would say that it is the most complete one that I am familiar with right now, but I, I could be missing something. Do they also have figures for that particular collection about sort of print runs for particular yep. cards? Yep. Yeah. That's also a big mystery, at least for me as a collector, especially of real photo postcards is, did they print 10 of these, 100, yeah. 500? It's very, you know, sometimes a particular card, you see a number of copies of you figure, it must have been a relatively large, even what relatively large means is, is sort of a mystery. Yeah. Because they were being produced by amateurs, yep. amateur photographers who were selling, but still amateurs. Yeah. Yeah. I see an observation from my colleague, uh, Ilhan Sitak, Lehigh's Archives and Special Collections librarian, who I will credit with uh, devising the title, No Postage Necessary for our Exhibit. But he has observed uh, that um, Hallmark greeting cards still seem to be very popular, but postcards have declined in popularity. Um, the question would be why um, why in general might we have an obsession about um, handing a pre-constructed greeting card to someone, but um, not sending them a postcard? That's a really interesting question. And I'm sort of thinking now about sort of what is the, the cultural role of the card and what cultural space is that filling? Maybe the, the cards mark an event in the way that postcards didn't necessarily need to mark, but that's, that's a guess. Um, I feel like it's good food for thought. Scott, yeah. do you have any? I, I'm wondering if, if it's, if it's the privacy of a greeting card, oh, yeah. up, even though, even though we seem to expose everything about our lives in ways that it earlier <laughs> Generations or decades <laughs> didn't, but still the greeting card is sealed and the postcard That's is true. wide open. That's you know, true. We're obsessed with privacy. Mm -hmm. We expose everything about ourselves. I feel like uh, that's a real that's given me a lot to think about, though. Another um uh person on the chat mentions um uh, 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 probably aren't familiar with this group, but it's a very active group on Facebook. It's called uh photo postcards. Are PPC real photo postcards yep. unidentified, and oh. people share real photo postcards of places usually not yeah. available. And the group has been incredibly because they're all you know there are thousands of people yeah. in the group all over the place, all over the globe, uh, uh, and they've been incredibly successful at identifying what seem to be unidentifiable landscapes, you know, urban landscapes, yep. but, but yep. you know, from a tiny little sign in a building to the you know, to the shape of the downtown street, they've been able to to look to identify the spot for the person who has the query about it. So, this oh, that's astonishing. Yeah, there's uh, yeah, crowdsourcing, oh, very cool, solving very cool. Otherwise, unidentifiable real photo postcards. Yeah, it seems to be an archivist dream. You refer to crowdsourcing <laughs> that enables uh -huh. us um, to to do a lot of archival work as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I guess there aren't any more general uh, databases, though. They're, so they're the ones in these particular institutions that have done a great job of cataloging what they have, but there's no, um, um, you know, uh, Library of Congress database or something that, that has tried to assemble every postcard. I mean, it would just be vast. I guess too bad. I mean, I, part of me, part of me has to laugh at sort of the postcards. It almost feels like the fossil record where you're going to have organisms that have lived and gone extinct that you simply don't know about because yeah. there's no fossil trace preserved. Yeah. And to me, that feels like it's, there's almost a parallel in postcards, that postcards that are made I, and sent and yeah. destroyed. And we have no idea that they that they were sort of part yeah. of this vast network. Um I think that that the postcards that do have deep, intense 
collections and archival sort of metadata associated with them um, are sort of tied to specific manufacturers or specific motifs or specific interests. Like you say, there's a collector that's really interested yeah. and they they yeah. put this together. Yeah. And so it sort of feels like it's additive or sort of cumulative rather than sort of top down of I am now going to archive all postcards that were ever on yeah. earth. I love that image of the fossil record where a piece yeah. is missing. I mean, with this one person I collect, this 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 photographer who was basically here in our town between 1907 and 1909, a number of his cards, I don't know the mechanism, I would love to know, were bought by postcard companies and sold as printed cards. So I know, you know, I have the, or, you know, one could collect the real photo postcard plus the printed right. card. And there are some printed cards that I'm almost sure are his images but I've never seen the real photo version of it, which came first. So it's that, you know, so this trace of it. it, it yeah, it's so almost like card. this echo, right? Right, yeah, an echo, but the real photo one, I mean, there might be one or two out there that, um, you know, that will be discovered soon or something. But but as far as we know, there's just the printed card and the real photo has, has disappeared. Oh, wow. It is like that fossil. Yeah, fossil. yeah, wow. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is, this has been wonderful. Um, such an interesting exchange of ideas. I, I don't think I'll be looking at postcards the same way again, at least in, in my world. But um, I think we've um, we've responded to the majority of questions at this point. And um, I do um, do either uh, of you, Scott or Lydia, uh, have any any final thoughts? Any final reports final before we close? Is, uh, uh, Lois, you just I think posted a link in the chat to Lydia's book. I would say every, my final thought is buy this book. It should be on a postcard sent around, <laughs> but what we have is a chat bar there. Well, thank you. I'm so excited. Yeah. I, I feel inspired to go send a bunch of postcards this <laughs> evening. So thank you all for that, that inspiration here. Okay. Well, thank you all for attending. Uh, this has been wonderful. And um, you've given us um, a, a lot of inspiration at this point. Um, maybe instead of uh, holiday cards, uh, we should all be sending postcards. There you go. Might be one way. But uh, thank you both. Um, it's been um, such a pleasant afternoon. And um, I look forward to learning more about your upcoming research and projects. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And have a good evening. <laughs>